The purpose of cross-connection control is to prevent contaminated water from entering the potable water system, which could result in disease outbreak due to biological contamination or public exposure to hazardous chemicals, such as pesticides, and those might come from residential or agricultural situations, or metals, which could come from cooling system cross-connections, or from metal fabrication and plating shops. Also, organic compounds, which could come from air conditioning systems or car washes, and nitrates and nitrites, which are used in boilers and cooling systems. An example of a cross-connection that caused an outbreak of disease happened in 1933 at the World Fair in Chicago. There was back siphonage in two hotels due to system pressure loss. The drinking water was contaminated with dysentery causing microorganisms and more than 1,400 people were infected with 98 confirmed deaths. Other known causes of disease transmission due to backflow include the transmission of hepatitis, salmonella, E. coli, and other gastrointestinal disorders. According to the Centers for Disease Control, there were approximately 12,000 illnesses caused by backflow between 1970 and 2001. Well, here's a list of some potential cross connections and their associated hazard level. An agricultural pesticide mix tank, that poses a very high hazard level. Industrial boilers are also a high hazard level. Industrial cooling towers also are at a high hazard level. Toilets with the flush valves or the pressurized toilet systems uh, often found in commercial establishments are potential cross connections and they also present a high hazard level. Laboratory glassware washers are high levels and also sinks like in the janitor's closet it's possible if there's a hose coming off the faucet that is submerged into the sink should the pressure in the system uh, drop low enough or a vacuum be created it might siphon the water in the sink back so sinks are also a potential cross connection sprinkler systems uh, also pose a high hazard level well, let's take a look at some backflow due to back pressure. And here we have a chemical mix tank. This would represent our agricultural uh, chemical mix tank. And you can see that it provides chemical to crop dusters. And this tank is pressurized with an air compressor. And it takes water from the uh, potable water system and goes directly into the tank. So when we open this valve, we have cross-connected the systems and the water flows into the tank. Well, then we shut the valve and then the air compressor kicks on and the tank is pressurized. So as this tank pressure increases to a pressure that's greater than system pressure, any leak by through that valve will allow flow of that chemical into the potable water system. So this is an example of backflow due to back pressure. An air gap in this situation would solve this problem and prevent backflow. Another example of backflow due to back pressure is in a manufacturing plant where they reclaim their water. So during the manufacturing process their water gets reclaimed and it gets pumped back to the process. So they're reusing their water in the system. Well this works out well as long as the pressure of the public water supply is greater than the pressure of the reclaimed water system. Well if the water system or the, wa the public water system pressure drops you'll have backflow due to back pressure in that circumstance. So these are two examples of backflow due to back pressure. Now we're going to take a look at backflow due to back siphonage. So here we have a young couple driving down the street. They take out the fire hydrant and they cause a geyser in the street. Well this sudden 
uh, flow of water out causes a drop in pressure in the system which would cause a back siphonage condition from a high-rise building. So if you have a system, a water system in this high-rise building, uh, it could be a janitor's closet with the hose stuck down into the sink or it could be some type of laundry system that's connected to the potable water system. With that pressure drop in the main portion of the water system, that would cause a siphon or back siphonage into the water system. So that's an example of back siphonage. Now we're going to take a look at different backflow control devices. The air gap is the first one we'll look at. And an air gap provides the highest level of protection. The gap must be two times the inside diameter of the inlet pipe. And here you can see that this space between where the water comes out of the pipe and the surface or the maximum surface of where that water is going must be two times the pipe diameter. But there's a minimum gap of one inch above the water level that's required as well. So in small diameter piping systems, it, there needs to be at least one inch of an air gap. The next type of backflow control device is the Reduced Pressure Zone Backflow Preventer, or the RPZ. The RPZ has two spring-loaded check valves and a pressure-regulated relief valve between the check valves. Here you can see the, one of the check valves. And if a back pressure condition is sensed, the relief valve will open up and create an air gap between the two check valves. This type of device can be used on all cross connections, including high hazard connections. So this is considered to be equivalent protection to an air gap because of this air gap that's created between the two check valves. Another type of backflow control device is the double check valve. They're designed like the RPZ, but they don't have the relief valve in between the two check valves to create that open zone. So there is no external indication of valve failure in this case. As we're with the RPZ, if there's a blocked check valve, you'll see drippage from that gap between the two check valves. This type of device is not recommended where failure may result in a health hazard. Vacuum breakers, called atmospheric vacuum breakers or AVB, are not designed to protect against back pressure and they're only used where there's no possibility of back pressure. They're installed six inches above the highest point of the downstream outlet. So these are designed to break vacuum by allowing atmospheric pressure in the system. Another type of vacuum breaker is the pressure vacuum breaker or the PVB and it's not designed to protect against back pressure either. It's a two valve assembly where one valve is closed with spring pressure when flow stops and the second valve opens and allows air in to break the vacuum. And these are installed 12 inches above the highest point of the downstream outlet. The final thing I want to talk about in this lesson is reclaimed water. Many cities are using reclaimed water for non-potable applications to supplement their water supply and this creates a risk of cross-connection. Places where it's used include golf courses and industrial parks as well as highway vegetation irrigation projects. Well, The air gap is the most positive cross-connection protection and is recommended in these circumstances. So where a potable water system combines or also supplies water to irrigate a golf course where the reclaimed water uh, is given to the golf course and feeds the pressure system for irrigation. If there's any intermixing of the reclaimed water and the potable water that should go into a tank and there should be an air gap between the potable water system and that mixed tank. Just keep in mind that reclaimed water piping is purple to designate that it's not a potable water system but a reclaimed water system.